Now, if you're allergic to transformers but still need a step-up converter with a large input to output voltage ratio, one solution is the cascaded boost and another is to use a charge pump on the output of a conventional boost converter. Now, although transformer allergy is a very serious condition, it should be pointed out that a transformer is a bulky and expensive component which more often than not needs to be custom made. And as long as you don't need its most important benefit, the galvanic isolation, you should be able to make a cheaper design without it. So there are two topologies I want to highlight today. First is the cascaded boost converter. In short, this is a series of boost converters interconnected one after the other. The usage of two stages is common, but more could be used if needed. The idea here is that each stage boosts by only a certain amount, so you never have to use extreme duty cycles. And if you want the boosting ratio to be the same over all stages, they can all be driven with the same duty cycle. From a control point of view, you can have individual control circuits driving each power stage. This will result in better transient response. Or if you're interested in simplicity, you can have a single control circuit driving both circuits with the same duty cycle. Just to exemplify this, I created the basic boost converter and while a cascaded boost with two stages, which are driven with the exact same control signal. So in both cases, the signal generator is set to have a 50% duty cycle. So if we run this and we check the standalone boost converter, we are getting around 20 volts, double that of the input voltage. And if we look to the cascaded boost, after the first stage, we are getting more or less the same thing. So also 20 volts, 19.98. However, if we look at the output, so after the second stage, we are getting about double that. So here in red, we see 40 volts. Now, different duty cycles will give different results, of course, but we can clearly see the multiplication effect of the multiple stages. On the other side, we have the boost charge pump, which, like the name suggests, is built from a boost converter, and on top of this, charge pump cells can be added. The idea here is that the boost charges the first capacitor, and then when the switch is on, the charge moves into the storage capacitor, and finally, at the next cycle, the voltage is then transferred to the output. So this sort of circuit basically multiplies the output voltage of the boost by the number of charge pump stages. However, regardless of the multiplication ratio, you only have a single switching transistor. So from that point of view at least, it's significantly simpler than the cascaded topology. To highlight this topology, I kept the basic boost converter that we've previously built and then copied it and added a charge pump stage on top. So here again, in both cases, a 50% duty cycle is provided. And if we run the simulation, we can see that from an input of 10 volts at the output of the boost converter, we are getting about double that, so 19.99. And if we look at the output of the charge pump, we are doubling the voltage again. So from 20 volts, we are going up to 40 volts. So we can clearly see the doubling effect of the charge pump stage. Now, the main reason why we would even consider using one of these topologies has to do with the large output voltage transformation or gain that can be achieved. In the case of the normal ideal boost converter running under continuous conduction mode, the exact gain is related to the duty cycle by the classical formula. To highlight the effect, I calculated the gain values for duty cycles between 10 and 90% just to keep the converter in a reliable operating range. And within this interval, the maximum gain that we can get is a factor of 10. So the output voltage will be 10 times larger than the input. Now, moving on to the boost charge pump, the output will be the previous value multiplied by the number of charge pump elements. So for a single charge pump cell, we should get double the initial value. So with this setup, we are getting a clear improvement, giving us a maximum gain of 20. So in our formula, this then represents the multiplication of the charge pump stage. Anyway, moving on to the cascaded boost converter, this takes the voltage from the original boost converter and then reboosts it. So for a two stage converter with both stages running the same duty cycle, the output is the square of the initial value. 
Now, this sounds like a lot, and while the maximum gain that we can get is 100. However, applying this strategy only becomes useful when running duty cycles larger than 50%, since up to this point, the values are smaller for the cascaded boost compared to the boost charge pump. Finally, looking at the formula, here n represents the number of cascaded circuits. Now, to look at the values, we can get a nicer look if we plot out these on a logarithmic scale. So here, it becomes a bit more clear that both topologies, so both the boost charge pump and the cascaded boost, have larger gain compared to the normal boost converter, but the exact slope and the gain is different. So finally, let's now confirm this behavior in the circuit simulator. For this, I took the circuits that we've previously used and modified the signal generator to use the duty cycle parameter. So the on time will be the duty cycle times the period of 2 microseconds. And while well, the duty cycle is stepped from 10 to 90 in steps of 10. Next, I also had to modify the load in each converter to be to an extent at least duty cycle dependent, so to have more or less a constant power load for the converters to always operate in more or less the same way. And finally, I added in some measurement statements to calculate the exact gain each of the converters have. Now, after running the simulation and waiting for it to finish, it does take a while since I left it to stabilize for 44 milliseconds, eventually we can go into the error log to observe our results. Here we can look at the values or we can right click plot stepped measured data and a new window appears in which we can add our traces of interest, so the gain for the free converters. And here we are getting a similar graph to what our spreadsheet was telling us, well apart from this error point. Now, it's also important to notice that the values that we are getting here are not exactly the same as the ones that we had in our spreadsheet. So based on the accuracy of the simulated circuit, your simulation will yield usually smaller values than the theoretical analysis, since in the spreadsheet we used perfectly ideal components. Here in the simulation we're also using more or less ideal components, but that will not always be the case. The various losses that occur in real life will limit the exact gain that can be obtained. So it's important to confirm what the exact chosen components can actually achieve before committing to one circuit or another. Now, this circuit seems to be working as predicted by the mathematics. So what's the catch? Why aren't these two topologies more common? Well, it's important to also look at the stresses to which the components are subjected during operation. Let's start with the cascaded boost. So the first thing to observe is that each stage can be dimensioned according to the electrical parameters in use. So all of the components, the inductor, the diode, the transistor, can be fine-tuned for the exact currents and voltages that are present. So here, the first stage is a high current, low voltage implementation, whereas the second stage is a lower current, but higher voltage implementation. And while with more stages, current will go down, but voltage will increase. Now, specifically in the case of the two converters driven with the same duty cycle, one simplification can be implemented in which a single switching transistor is used and connected using an extra diode to the first stage. This reduces the number of transistors, however, it also means that the transistor needs to withstand both the high voltage of the second stage as well as the high currents of the first plus the second stage. So, with our two stage design, we can quickly confirm that the maximum voltage experienced by the switch is more or less equal to the output voltage of its boost stage. So this is true for the first stage, the maximum voltage of 20 volts is observed, and while well, the same is valid for the second stage, where we are getting 40 volts. The other thing that we can confirm is that the currents present in the first converter, so I'm just looking at the inductor now, we are getting around 300 something milliamps, the values are larger than the ones found in the second converter, so here the inductor values are below 250 milliamps. Now, if we move on to the single switch design and we look at the voltage present in the single switch, we can see that this is more or less the same value as the complete output, so it's running at 40 volts. But when we check the currents 
running through the two inductors and we also check the switch current, we can see that the peak switching current is higher than each of the individual stages and well, it's actually the sum of the two. So the peaks are around 250 and 360 milliamps for the two inductors and the total switch current is around 650 milliamps. So even though this converter is built with a single switch, the stresses that the switch needs to endure are far higher than the stresses that the switches in the separated circuit C. If we now move on to the boost charge pump, because of the way in which it moves voltage through the multiplier, all the components, so transistor, diodes and capacitors, will only see the voltage that the initial boost converter creates. The only component that could see a large output voltage is a global output capacitor, which is not really mandatory to be used. So now let's just quickly confirm this in the simulator. So here we can see that the voltage present on the switch has a maximum of 20 volts, the same that is present on the boost output capacitor. And well, we can check the voltages to which the various components are exposed. So the first diode, second diode, third diode, and well, the various other capacitors. And in all cases, we are never exceeding the 20 volt maximum. So even though the complete output is 40 volts, no individual component actually ends up seeing this value. So all in all, by this analysis at least, the cascaded boost needs higher voltage rate components compared to the charge pump if both are designed to output the same exact voltage. Last thing to mention is the noise of the two circuits. So one important aspect in modern day electronic design is preventing the switching converters from affecting the nearby circuits. The less noise the circuit creates, the more useful it can be. Starting with the two-stage cascaded boost, well, it's a couple of boost converters. Nothing special really happens here. We have two switching nodes, one more noisy than the other, so the second one is switching larger voltages, and from a current point of view, we have the typical waveforms of a boost converter. And while the currents are smaller in the second stage compared to the first stage. With a good design, the switching nodes can be kept small and the hot loops can also be easily minimized. Now, the charge pump circuit analysis is a bit more complex. So, to start things off, the base booster is the same as before, it's a booster, but when we add the charge pump bit on top, we get a few differences. So, first off, the charge moving between the first two capacitors is very sudden. It will be occurring in spikes, since there isn't really anything to limit the current. So this will be visible in the first diode current, as well as in the switch current. Next, because the charge pump capacitor does not stay at a fixed voltage in respect to ground, you will also get an extra switching node on top of the first capacitor. Finally, the current in the third diode is a bit less steep, since this is also coming through the inductor. So the inductor fall ramp current is the sum of the two right facing diodes. Now, just as a side note, I did find cases where resistors were added in series with this diode to limit its current spikes. However, this will bring losses. So it's not always something that you want to do. The last aspect to consider related to the current running through the design is that we have multiple hot loops. So places where current is discontinuous. We have the old loop from the boost, but also we are getting extra loops through the new diodes. So the noise area with this type of converter will be rather large. Now for the simulations, I will just stick to the boost charge pump just to confirm the expected behaviors. So with this, we don't just have our first, but also we have our second switching node, both the classical one as well as one inside of the charge pump cell. And while well, if we check the current running through the reverse diode, we see that it's quite a sharp spike, which is also observed on the switch. Finally, if we also add in a resistor in series with this diode, we can observe that the current running through it is much, much smaller, so you're no longer getting the spike. However, this resistor is adding in losses. So if we check the output voltage of the base converter, and the one with the added resistor, we see that we are getting a slightly smaller voltage. So this added component, although will reduce the noise, 
will also reduce the gain of the converter. In the end, both the boost charge pump as well as the cascaded boost converter are practically used designs. Usually, you will see the boost charge pump as part of low power circuits, so whenever a small high voltage supply is needed, I personally use this type of circuit to supply vacuum tubes or Nixies, and while well, for the cascaded boost, I mainly found it mentioned in high power circuits, usually something related to solar panel installations, but I guess it can be used in other applications as well. As long as it's dimensioned accordingly, it should work just fine. And with that said, hope you got some useful information after this, leave your thoughts in the comments, thank you for watching, make sure to subscribe to be up to date with my latest videos, and see you next time. Bye bye.